Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, as we study, we're going to be looking at actually Numbers, the last half of Numbers 28 uh, and also all of Numbers 29. I wanted to make this into one video. Last week uh, we looked at uh, the beginning of Numbers 28 and we discussed burnt offerings. So I would encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to, to watch that, that kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about on the rest of this video. But we discussed last week that, that Jesus is our burnt offering. He, 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 that's what he was. And, and the, the, the text is clear in the New Testament that Jesus became the burnt offering that, that God was requiring in the Old Testament. But Paul, as we discussed last week, seems to say that every follower of Jesus is to also live our, we are to live our lives in such a way that we are a burnt offering. Our lives are a burnt offering to God. Now, we began looking at all these offerings that God wanted from His people last week. We talked about how He wanted an offering every morning and every night. He wanted an offering every Sabbath, one day a week. He wanted an offering at the beginning of every month. And that's kind of where we stopped, and we're going to keep going from there today. So we're going to look at the last half, beginning on at Numbers 28, looking at verse 16 is where we're going to pick up. But in the, in the verses of, of Numbers 28, 16, all the way through Numbers uh, 29, God gives seven festivals that He wanted His people to observe. Okay, And many times, I will say this, as Christians, we often have not studied these in, in, in great detail. I think there are different reasons for that. I think part of it is, you know, well... Jesus fulfilled a lot of these things. He, he became, we're under the new covenant now, so we really don't need to know about the old covenant. But I'm telling you, there's so much in these festivals that we can learn about our walk with Jesus today. And so I want us to look at that today, and we're going to begin looking at Numbers 28. And in verses 16 through 25, we're, we're going to have to not read a lot of, of, about some of these festivals so that we can get through all of them. I would encourage you, though, to go back and read Numbers 28 and Numbers 29 and read about the different festivals in great detail. But in, in verses 16 through 25, God gives His instructions for Passover, Pesach, okay, uh, or Pesach. Now, we call it the festival or the feast of unleavened bread or matzah. It, excuse me. That is, can, that is also included in Passover. They're kind of one starts with Passover and it goes into unleavened bread or matzah. Okay, so that's kind of two different festivals, but they're kind of joined at the same time. So they kind of go together. And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. Look at verses 16 and 17 of Numbers 28 with me. We're just going to read a couple verses here. Here's what it says. On the 14th day of the first month shall be the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of this month shall be a feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. So you see Passover and the day after begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which goes for an additional uh, seven days. So Passover was the first celebration, the first festival on God's calendar. It was in the spring, so March-April time frame. And, and it began this week-long celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Matzah. So let, Passover was one of the most important festivals in, in the entire year. It, it was something that they look back on how God delivered them from Egypt. So, of course, that's why you had this unleavened bread. You didn't have time to prepare things. Let's go. So you had this unleavened bread. Now, for every day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all seven days, the people would offer burnt offerings that were equivalent to what he had already prescribed as the once-a-month offerings. Every day for seven days, that same offering, essentially, that he wanted uh, for them to give him once a month. He says, do that every single day for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So at the end of this eight-day celebration of Passover and Unleavened Bread, understand, 66 lambs were sacrificed, 14 bulls, 7 rams, 7 goats, 
seven and a half bushels of fine flour, over 25 gallons of olive oil, and one half gallon of wine. So these, this is huge. God is saying, I, I want you to understand the importance. And because of that, I want you to offer all these things to me at Passover and unleavened bread. Now, I, don't, I want you to, to keep in mind, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection occurred during this Jewish celebration of Passover and unleavened bread. So Jesus fulfilled that Passover and unleavened bread sacrifice. The bread of life died as our unleavened bread. So therefore, in the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples to eat matzah, unleavened bread, in remembrance of me, he says. Every time you eat this, every time you gather, I want you to eat this, and I want you to do it to remember that I am your sacrifice of unleavened bread. You're remembering me as that sacrifice. So we are to remember that Jesus is our unleavened bread every time we take the Lord's Supper. That should be on our mind, that He came, He fulfilled this sacrifice so that we don't have to still go through this every year. He became our unleavened bread. Now, there is one festival that we read about in Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14, if you want to go back, that that really isn't pulled out in great detail here in Numbers 28 and 29. And the reason for that, as we discussed last week, Leviticus 23 tells the common person what to do on all of these festivals. But the standpoint of Numbers 28 and 29, God is saying this in a different way. He's telling the priests how they are to do their duty on these festivals. Well, they don't really have a a big duty on on Leviticus, the one in Leviticus 23. It's not as so much about all these animals. So it's not included in the list. But it's the, 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 the Feast of First Fruits, the Spring first fruits that happens two days after Passover, it says in Leviticus 23. Two days after Passover is the beginning of the barley harvest. It it comes earlier in the year. The wheat harvest is later in the year. And so this is the first fruits celebration. It's a time to thank God for his goodness of bringing bread out of the earth. That's this barley harvest celebration of first fruits. In the spring. So during the temple period, the high priest would come and he would take uh, he would take sheaves of barley and, and he would wave them in the air during this first fruit celebration as a way of saying, God, thank you so much for your bread out of the earth. And all of the barley that comes after this, we are thanking you in advance because we know you're going to come through, giving us life from the earth. That, that's what they were doing. Their prayer was this. We have records. Here's what their prayer was. Lord, God of Israel, thank you for the beginning of this year's harvest. We offer to you the first fruits of this year's harvest. Lord, accept the first fruits, the beginning and the best of the harvest. Oh, Lord, accept us your people, and and please bring in the rest of the harvest. That's what they're saying on the the Feast of First Fruits as they wave the barley. Paul says, Paul says that Jesus is our first fruits. He fulfilled that offering. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says that Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first and best of the harvest. That's first fruits. He's the first and best. He is the model of what the rest of the harvest is supposed to look like. That, that's what Jesus is. Now, today, the day we call Resurrection Sunday, do you know what day it happened on? It happened on the Feast of First Fruits. He was raised as the first fruit of the harvest that's to come. So we continue our look at Numbers 28. In verses 26 to 31, we get to uh, God's instruction of the Feast 
of weeks. Hebrew, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. Today, we call it by its Greek name. It's the same festival, the same feast. It's just called by a different name. We call it Pentecost. The Hebrew name, though, is Shavuot. Now, it is the first fruit of the wheat harvest. You see the difference. There's a first fruits harvest we see in Leviticus 23, two days after Passover. That's the first fruits of the barley harvest. This, Shavuot, is 50 days after Passover. And it is the first fruit of the wheat harvest. Okay, that's the difference. So when you read about first fruits, you have to distinguish. Is this the spring one early in the year, this barley? Or is this 50 days later, this the wheat first fruits? And this one now in Numbers 28 is talking about the wheat first fruits. So in Leviticus 23, we read at this, at, at this time, Shavuot, they were to make two loaves of bread and go back and wave them just like we talked about with the barley as their wave offering. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think those loaves of bread were supposed to be made with or without leaven? If you're like me, you probably think, oh, God didn't want leaven. Leaven represents sin. So God probably told them to, to, to make it without leaven and wave it without leaven because he can't be around sin. That, that doesn't sound like him. No, that's, that's incorrect. It says specifically in Leviticus 23, they were to make their bread with leaven. Why? Why? Well, leaven does represent sin. It was a reminder as they waved that to God, even our best isn't perfect. We still have sin. So even our Everything we offer that's the best that we have to offer, it still contains sin. And it's a reminder that God still loved them. Even if they weren't perfect, even if their offerings were not spectacular, spotless, I still love you. It reminds me of, of Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were not perfect, God says, that's okay. I still love you. I still want to use you. I still want to partner with you. And God loves us despite our imperfections. Know that today. Because every year when they offered that sacrifice at Shavuot, Pentecost, we say, they offered it with leaven. The other thing celebrated at Shavuot was God giving the Ten Commandments. See, rabbis, years and years ago, centuries ago, looked at God's Word, and it says, essentially, in Exodus 19, I believe is where, where it's found, it took about three months. Anyway, if you do the math, around Shavuot, around Pentecost, we say, is when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God gave Moses. From the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know the people in Jesus' day absolutely believed Shavuot was the day that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, without a doubt. That's what the people in Jesus' day believed. So, part of Shavuot was a celebration of God coming down and giving the people His Word. We'll come back to that thought in just a few minutes. I want to keep going. Okay, so we're still in the, we've talked about the spring festivals. Started uh, at the very beginning with Passover, Pesach. Then we went to the Feast uh, of Unleavened Bread, seven days. Feast of First Fruits. Okay, those are three together in the spring. Fifty days later, we get what we call Pentecost. They call Shavuot. So now we're going to transition into Numbers chapter 29, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our day together. And, and I want us to look at the fall festivals, because here's the deal. All of the spring festivals have been fulfilled through Jesus. 
Things happen. What happened at Pentecost? Acts 2. Things have happened at every one of the spring festivals, and Jesus has fulfilled them. But now we're going to start looking at the fall festivals. And let me just tell you this, Christian. These festivals have not been fulfilled. And I believe with all my heart, as Christians believers, we need to know about these fall festivals. There are things that we can learn about our walk with Christ and what's to come with these three fall festivals. And I believe that we should still be celebrating, not necessarily as a Jew. We should be looking towards these festivals, learning from them, and figuring out what is to come based on these festivals. So I want you to dig in with me this morning as we look at these three fall festivals. The next holiday on God's calendar is the Feast of Trumpets. We see it in Numbers 29, verses 1 through 6. Just look at the very first two verses with me. Verse 1, Numbers 29, verse 1. Now in the seventh month, so this is seven months after uh, after, uh, the first ones, okay? Seven months later, after Pesach and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Matzah, okay, comes this. Seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall... Also have a holy convocation and a sacred assembly. All of you get together. You shall do no laborious work, no working. It will be to you a day for blowing trumpets. You shall offer a burnt offering as a soothing aroma to the Lord. One bull, one ram, seven male lambs, one year old without defect. And he goes on. But but let's, let's kind of break this down. The Feast of Trumpets, also called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, okay? It happened on the first day of the seventh month. The Feast of Trumpets started with the blowing of a shofar. This is a shofar, okay? Priest would blow the shofar, and that would celebrate the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Shofar is a ram's horn. In ancient Israel, there were many reasons in the Bible and in extra biblical uh, writings that we see a shofar was to be blown. Well, let's look, let's look at that. Because if God is saying blow a shofar, I bet he's not just taking this out of context of what they did this for in ancient Israel. I think he's trying to make a statement about something. And it's an important statement. So why did they blow shofars? In, in their culture, why was this blown? Well, let me give you a list. If there was danger the shofar was blown. If important information was being proclaimed, let's say a king or somebody had some sort of important declaration to make, before he made it, the shofar's blown. If people were gathering for some appointed time or some special event to begin that event, shofar's blown. If the people were preparing for battle, Part of the preparation for battle, shofar's blown. If a king was coming to visit a town, at the moment of his arrival, they would blow a shofar. If, if a new king was being crowned or if a new high priest was being appointed, the shofar was blown. And last but not least, if a bridegroom arrives to claim his bride, They blew a shofar. Now, why why is that important? I hope you're getting this sense as I'm saying why a shofar is blown. Because what's going to happen when Jesus comes back? The Feast of Trumpets is saying there is judgment day coming, but one day a king is coming back. And there's other texts where Jews even thought that this was going to point to the Messiah. And it was going to be signaled by the blowing of a shofar. Listen to some New Testament scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, at the last shofar. For the shofar will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. What's going to happen on the last days? What's going to happen when Jesus calls us home? A shofar is blown. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
and with the voice of the archangel and with the shofar of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. There is a day coming, guys. Our King, our Messiah, our our High Priest will come back. And on that day, a shofar is blown because that's what happens when a King and a Messiah and, and, and a High Priest come. A shofar is blown. Listen to Matthew 24. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great shofar. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Do you understand what happens when Jesus returns? He fulfills every reason a shofar is blown in Scripture. He comes back as our king. He comes back as our Messiah. He comes back as our high priest. So it's announced by a shofar. He comes back to lead the charge because there is a battle, a great final battle. So the shofar is blown to begin that battle. He comes back as our bridegroom to get his bride. So the shofar is blown. Do you see why over and over in Scripture it's talked about that that day is marked by the great shofar. He comes to fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Don't miss that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Let's keep going in Numbers 29 because I want us to see the last two festivals, of the fall festivals, that I think every believer needs to learn about. So we're on the sixth festival. It's the festival of Yom Kippur. We call it the Day of Atonement. We see this in Numbers 29, verses 17 through 15. This takes place, by the way, 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets. The shofar is blown. Feast of Trumpets begins. 10 days later is Yom Kippur. 10 days later, the Day of Atonement. Rabbis teach... Every Jew must repent during those 10 days. Between the day of the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur, you better repent. They're called the Days of Awe, that 10-day period. The Days of Awe. And they are intense. They are filled with prayer and with self-reflection. Every Jew stops and thinks about and prays about what they need to change and repent from. So, it's a time relationships are restored. Forgiveness is to be offered and reconciliation is to be sought. That's those days of all. Now, why is it so intense? Well, according to their tradition, if you don't repent in those 10 days, God will blot your name out of the book of life. So yes, they are very intense days. You don't want God to blot your name out of the book of life. And if sometime in the next year you die, you're not spending eternity with Him in their view. So you better be right in those 10 days. Get right in your relationships with other people. Get right in your relationship with the Lord. That's what they believe, okay? So this day of atonement is a day of judgment Cleansing and atonement. That's Yom Kippur, okay? Now, for the actual day of Yom Kippur, that one day, okay, it is truly a day of fasting. There's no work to be done. Look at Numbers 29, verse 7 with me. Then on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. So again, a sacred assembly, all of you get together, and you shall humble yourselves and not do any work. On Yom Kippur, that one day you are not to do any work. So they do come together. 
It's the one day a year the high priest is was able to, in the Old Testament time, go into the Holy of Holies. It's the only day of the year. Let me ask you a question. What would happen if that one day he was unclean? Well, he would be struck down on the spot. God cannot be around sin. And if he were sinful and he was not repentant, he was not clean he was dead. That, that's, that is exactly what happened on Yom Kippur. So understand Yom Kippur is a picture of judgment where one person stands face to face with God. And if he's clean, he lives. And if he's unclean, he's dead. That's Yom Kippur. We must be clean to be in his presence. How can we be clean? The only way we can be clean is if the blood of Jesus covers us. We discussed that last week. It's the only way we can stand before him as clean. What about the final festival, the last fall festival? Then we're going to put all of them together and recap them together. I think that's going to really help this make sense to you. The final festival on God's calendar we see in verses 16 to 38 in Numbers 29. It is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. This is Sukkot, is the Hebrew word, Sukkot. Now, it lasts eight days and this is an absolute joyful time. This is their Thanksgiving. Okay, this is, these are eight joy filled days. Days. These are exciting days. And one interesting thing about this feast is the number of animals it calls for in Numbers 29 to be sacrificed. See, it starts the first, the first time you sacrifice all these things in, in, in this, this time period. You sacrifice 12 young bulls, 2 rams, and 14 male lambs. Okay, And each day, they would sacrifice one less. So the day after, it would be, it would be um, 11 young bulls. The day after that, 10 young bulls. The day after that, 9 young bulls. That's what it says specifically in Numbers 29. You can read it for yourself. By the end of this celebration okay, of Sukkot, by the end of this celebration, listen to how many animals were sacrificed. 71 bulls, 15 rams, 122 lambs, all sacrificed as burnt offerings fully, 100%, all sacrificed. That must be one special feast to God if he wants that many animals sacrificed. It's incredible. Now, what did this feast celebrate? Why, why did he call it Sukkot? Why does it feast of uh, uh, booths? Why is it feast, feast of tabernacles? Well, the feast of tabernacles was a time that God wanted his people to remember that he protected them during those 40 days in the wilderness. During this whole numbers that we're talking about, this whole, all this that we're doing on the study of the book of numbers, this entire time, God is protecting them. He's providing for them. He's being all they need. He is with them. Well, Sukkot was the time of year. Every year, God says, I want you to remember how I provided for you during those 40 years in the desert. So, every year, God's people were to build their own sukkah. Plural is sukkot. What's a sukkah? Sukkah is a temporary shelter. Think about it. For 40 years, they didn't have homes in the desert. They had to have little tents wherever they camped. And, and, and where did God live during that time? He lived in the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. He lived in a portable structure. So every year, God says, I want you to build your own tents. You and your family stay outside, not in your homes, but in a sukkah, a tent, during this feast, during this celebration. And I want you to remember that I was with you. You had my presence, my protection, and my provision the 40 years in the desert. That's me. That's what I did for you. In Zechariah 14, we find that, it, that a day is coming, this is huge, when all nations will celebrate Sukkot when we're with Him. 
Now understand, this is not a celebration that was supposed to end when Jesus came. This is a celebration that is supposed to look forward also to the day that we're with God for all eternity. And one day, God says, all nations will be with me and we're going to celebrate Sukkot together. That, that's what he says. See, right now, guys, we are living in our temporary home. That's what Sukkot is supposed to remind us of. That no matter where we live, if it's in houses or if it's in tents, this is still a temporary home. Our permanent home one day is in heaven with Him. One day we will have a permanent residence. Sukkot's a time to remind ourselves of that. And that while we're still here living in our temporary home, God is the one that is with us, that provides for us, that is present with us, that protects us just like he did those 40 days in the wilderness. Are we living for the day that we'll be with him for all eternity? That's what this celebration is for. Yes, it thanks God for how he's taken care of them in the past and how he currently takes care of them, but oh, don't miss this. It's a celebration to look forward to the day that we're with him celebrating this feast for all eternity. Oh, how I wish we as Christians still celebrated this because we need this every year to remind ourselves that where we are is temporary and one day we'll be with Him forever. Numbers 28, we discussed that Numbers 28 and 29 were the priestly functions. I mentioned that earlier in the video too, but, but all told, listen to this, every year, the priests would sacrifice 113 bulls, 32 rams, 1,086 lambs based on all these festivals in a year's time. That is incredible to me. They would sacrifice, they would give a ton of flour, a thousand bottles of oil, and a thousand bottles of wine. Now let me ask you, as I just read all that, which animal was sacrificed more than any other? It was the lamb. That's not accidental. It's no surprise. Jesus sees, excuse me, John the Baptist sees Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1. No wonder God wanted so many lambs sacrificed for sin. They pointed to Jesus who was the perfect lamb. So as we finish this morning, I want us to walk through very briefly all of these festivals. And I want you to see how Jesus has completed so many and how we should be looking forward to some things on the last three. So what was the first one on God's calendar? First one, Passover. Happens in March or April. It celebrates the deliverance from Egypt, the deliverance of bondage of slavery of his people. Jesus became that burnt offering, the perfect lamb that released us from our bondage of sin. And the day he was killed, that celebrated the deliverance of bondage, that was the day he was put on a cross. You understand, on Passover, on that day, the whole nation is celebrating the freedom they have that God has provided. That's the day that Jesus was put on the cross. Did you know? Five days before Passover is Lamb Selection Sunday, where every family comes to Jerusalem to pick their family lamb. Do you know what happened on that day during that last week of Jesus' life? It was the day of the triumphal entry. It's all, why were there so many people in the roads? Yes, it's Passover, but they're all there because it's Lamb Selection Day. And Jesus comes in. And all the people see him. And, and I, I'm telling you, his heart was this. Pick me as your lamb. Pick me as your spotless lamb this year. Pick me to be the one that represents your family from now for, to until forever. Because I'm about to die on Passover with all these other lambs. 
I want to be your family's Passover lamb. Pick me. Then he slaughtered on Passover. What happens the day after Passover? It begins the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of matzah. That's the day where every Jew prays a prayer that says, God, thank you for giving us bread from the earth. That's their prayer. On the day that the Jews are praying, God, thank you for giving us bread from the earth. Listen to what's going on. Jesus, our bread of life, is being planted in the ground. That's not accidental. What happens the next day? Well, that's the beginning of first fruits. Two days after Passover, it's the beginning of first fruits. This is where the first fruits of the spring harvest were offered at the temple. As the high priest is waving those sheaves of barley at the temple, what was happening to Jesus? He was being raised from the dead. As our first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 says. Oh, how incredible is that? What's the next festival? The festival of weeks, Shavuot. This happens 50 days later. Other name, Pentecost. This is the time that celebrates Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. Remember what happened when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments? What were the people doing? They were worshiping a golden calf. And you, you remember the story. 3,000 people were struck down that day. Exodus 32, 28. 3,000 people died the day that the law was given. On the very same day, during the year of Jesus' death, Acts 2.41 says that 3,000, about 3,000, direct reference back to the Old Testament, were saved. So don't miss this. On the day his people were celebrating the law, they were given the Holy Spirit, which released them from living under the law so that we could, it says, live under the Spirit, Galatians 5.18. That all happened on the same day. Do you see how the first four festivals of God's calendar have already been fulfilled? Okay, let's talk about the last three. Next, the festival of trumpets, shofar. The festival of trumpets. This is awesome. This happens in September or October. The other name, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. This celebrates the beginning of the civil new year in Israel. A shofar is blown that announces a judgment day is coming. In 10 days is Yom Kippur. You better understand these days of awe are important. Get right with your relationship with other people. Get right with your relationship with God. This is important. This is Rosh Hashanah. On the day, excuse me, one day, Jesus is going to return for his children. And you know what's going to mark that day? It's going to be a trumpet blast, a shofar blast. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead of, in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 Don't be surprised if that day happens on Rosh Hashanah. Every year, just so you know, I keep up with the day of Rosh Hashanah because I fully believe one day Jesus will come back. I don't know when it's going to be. Nobody does. Not even the Son knows, it says in Scripture. But Jesus has not missed a festival yet. The next one to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Listen, He entered on lamb selection. He was killed on Passover. He was planted in the ground on unleavened bread. He was raised on first fruits. He sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. What is the next festival to be fulfilled? 
the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Be ready for His coming. The next day is the Day of Atonement. Ten days later, Yom Kippur, September, October, just the same way. Now, this is the day to atone for the sins of the entire nation of Israel. The high priest enters the most holy place and he makes an offering. And it's a solemn day. His people pray and they realize that this is the day of judgment. The day is coming, guys, where we will be judged. We will stand in front of our Heavenly Father. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. Listen, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Are we living our lives in light of the day of judgment of Yom Kippur? This is a day for us to live in light of. And God says, one day a year, I want you to celebrate Yom Kippur and remind yourselves that Judgment Day is coming. Live in light of that day. Last one, Feast of Tabernacle or Sukkot. By the way, do you know when the Feast of Sukkot happens? It starts this Friday at sundown. Now listen, guys. This day celebrates God's provision, how He provides, He protects, He is there with them for 40 years in the desert. But it's also a time to look at our exodus to come. Our time to go and be with Him and live with Him in heaven for all eternity. See, a day is coming where we're going to be involved with an amazing exodus. And on that day, we'll be with our Heavenly Father in our forever home. Listen to, this, listen to this. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, 1 and 2. Listen, guys. One day. We will be with our Lord forever and ever and ever if we've accepted Jesus Christ. And I fully believe that we, even today, should look forward to celebrating Sukkot every year. Because we're going to celebrate it one day with Him. It should be a time that we reflect that we're in a temporary home here. But one day we will be with Him forever. Don't live for today. Don't live for what you see on this earth. Guys, live for heaven. Live for our eternal home. Live for God's kingdom, not our own. That's what God's calling us to do. I'm asking you. Learn from God's Word. These festivals are important to us. But I think what He's trying to tell us is the last three are yet to be fulfilled. Oh, how we need a time to reflect on how there's a judgment day coming. And we need to get our lives straight and our relationships right with others, our relationships right with Him, because one day He's coming back. And on that day, it's too late. But oh, there is a day coming after that where we are with Him forever. Let's live for that day. Pray with me. God, I thank you so much that you are coming back one day. Help us, God, to live for that day. Help us not to be blinded by this world, to be blinded by the enemy who wants us to live for this world. No, God, help us to live for you and your kingdom and what's in store. Oh, God, I look forward to that so much. You are so good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I always invite you to comment on these videos if you have questions. Um, if there's anything I can do to help you understand this better, I will. But I just thank you for watching, and I, I am praying for you, for this to be more than a lesson, for you to, to love God's Word, to want to dig in, 
and to live it out. See you later.